Morning, everyone. It's uh, my name's Craig Buerta, and we're back in, um, in in the series we're doing through the Book of Acts, uh, restoration uh, through the church. And this morning we're coming to chapter nine, where we're looking at uh, Saul of Tarshish, his great conversion story. And so let's pray together, and then we'll come to God's word. Lord Jesus, we just want to ask you again this morning, as you've done each week, to to speak to us and to open up your word to us, Lord, we pray that we may catch your heart and we may be changed through the story of the book of Acts, to do the book of Acts again. We, we pray that you would help us even now and that your name may be glorified, Lord, through this next half an hour as I deliver your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so... Last week, we listened to P.J. Smythe, who's our apostolic leader, preach over the book of Acts, and he spoke about um, what happened during the 30 years of the book of Acts, one generation, and how much they accomplished in taking the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth, and he challenged us and encouraged us to look at doing the book of Acts again in our generation. And so let's pick up the scripture here in chapter 9, and as we look at the the Saul who became the Apostle Paul and what he did in his generation after he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the scripture says, uh, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. And the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. And so they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus called Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarshish named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on his name. On your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake, for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. And then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. And for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Amen. And so... This morning, I want to talk to you about uh, making friends with a fanatic. Uh, it's the title of my message, Making Friends with a Fanatic. And what I want to do is to profile and look at the life of Saul on the one hand and then Ananias on the other hand. And so let's begin with Saul, um, who became the Apostle Paul. He is another catalytic leader in the early church. We looked at Philip uh, two weeks ago who was also a catalytic leader, someone who made things happen and advanced the kingdom of God. Philip was appointed as a deacon uh, in Acts chapter 6, and later on he goes on to become an evangelist and leader of Ivel in Samaria, 
and then lead the Ethiopian to Christ who went on to take the gospel into North Africa. But here we come to a very different person, and here we have uh, Saul, who really was a religious fanatic. He was a zealot. He was a radical, a Pharisee and a son of a Pharisee. He was a full-blooded Jew, circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, and the brightest student of his teacher, uh, Gamaliel. And so Saul was not just an activist, but he was also a brilliant intellectual. Um, and, and, and Saul hated Christians with a passion. And, he, he, and yet he, he went on to become the, the second most significant person in the history of the church and the spread of Christianity after Jesus himself. He wrote a quarter of the New Testament and two-thirds of the book of Acts tells his story um, because he was perfectly positioned to present a Jewish savior to the Gentile world. He came from Tarshish, which was a kind of a cosmopolitan city, and he also had a cross-cultural apostolic gift, and he was able to cross over barriers. And so over time, two wings of the church developed, if you like. There was a, a perhaps a more conservative wing in Jerusalem, uh, with the apostles there, and then a more radical wing that developed under the leadership of the apostle Paul that really reached out to the Gentile world. And so Paul is the most important apostle in the second phase of the history of the, of the early church, and, and we're now entering the second phase of that, of that history. But before he met Jesus, as I've said already, he was a terror he was like a wild and ferocious beast, breathing out threats, arresting Christians, men and women, and throwing them in prison. And here he, he gets letters of authority um, from the, um, the leaders, the Jewish leaders, and he's off to Damascus that he may uh, take hold of Christians who have escaped the persecution and fled. He's now chasing them in places like Damascus to bring them back to Jerusalem that they may be um, locked up and, and put in jail. And so this is the man that's also assisted in the murder of Stephen, uh, which is strange for someone who loved the Mosaic law. Um, and the sixth commandment says, you, you shalt not commit murder. And, and yet Paul's legalism and his, his, his fanaticism uh, caused him to, to overlook that in his zeal for Judaism of his time. In Acts 22, he himself says, he says, I persecuted the way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women. And so he hates Christians and he's angry with the teaching that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah because the Messiah was the promised deliverer that they were waiting for in the Old Testament. The Old Testament hope that the Messiah would come and deliver the, the, the people of Israel. Um, and he hated the teaching that Jesus was the Messiah because a Messiah crucified in weakness upon a cross was scandalous. Uh, anyone who died upon a tree in the Old Testament was considered to be under God's curse. And so uh, for Jesus to be the Jewish Messiah was really a contradiction in terms. Messiah meant deliverer, majestic. It meant triumph. Um, and crucifixion meant weakness and humiliation and defeat. And he also believed no one could be acceptable to God without becoming a Jew first and obeying the law of Moses. And so because he was a fanatic, he took action. Fanatics take action. Um, and yet religious fanatics, uh, as we see even today, um, they come under the power of the enemy that really wants to kill and to rob and to destroy. And some of the most angry people even today, suicide bombers uh, and so on, are, are the most religious people as well. Murderous older brothers who, who have hearts are filled with hatred. And so Saul was like that. He was a fanatic. But then in our story, we see the dramatic, secondly, we see the dramatic entrance of Jesus, heaven's champion, and, and this story is really the most famous conversion story in all of history as, as Jesus appears to him in that momentous event. One commentator, um, Charles Ball, says, as they started down the hill, he just puts it in his own terms, he says, a shaft of light brighter than the moonday sun 
fell on that little company on their way to Damascus. And its radiance was so great that the sun seemed dim. And they were dazzled by the sight and fell to the ground. And in bewilderment, they looked from one to another for an explanation of what had happened. And then they beheld their leader, Saul. And he was lying upon the ground while the frightened animal upon which he'd been riding stood nearby. And he was speaking now. And it was as though a voice was speaking to him, but they, but they, they, they couldn't understand its sound. And Saul's lips were moving and his hands were extended as if he was blind. And he was trembling from head to foot. And he realized he was in the hands of Almighty God. And there on the ground, with his sight taken away, he heard a voice speaking to him. And it was the voice of God saying in Saul's beloved tongue, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And this was the great crisis of Saul's life. He found himself face to face with the Messiah. And he had to acknowledge that he was wrong. And the Nazarenes were right. Jesus was the Christ. And as he lay there broken and beaten, the surrender was complete. And he said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And a voice from heaven said, arise and go into the city and it will be told to you what you must do. And so I want you to notice a few things from this, this great account here. I want you to notice a few things. First of all, I want you to notice that Paul did not, Saul did not want to be saved. He did not want to be converted. He was not looking for this. He hated Christians and he hated the Jesus that they worshipped. And he wasn't even seeking God because he, he felt he'd found God already as a true Jew. And, and, and while he's busy destroying the church that Jesus dies for, Jesus steps into his life and dramatically saves him. And so I want to suggest to you today, friends, that, that God can do anything he likes. He can even override our choices and our plans and our decisions because he is God. He can step in and reroute your life in an instant. And, and we see that here with, with, with Saul's conversion. And so Saul is now seeing on that Damascus road the glory of God as Jesus appears to him, just as Peter, James, and John witnessed the glory of God upon the Mount of Transfiguration. And in this, in this appearing, Jesus also calls him as an apostle. And so seeing the resurrected Christ was also a mark of these first generational apostles, the 12 apostles of the Lamb who were unique really in the foundation of the church, but then also the apostle Paul who was like one unnaturally born. Uh, he was the last person really to, to have an experience of the resurrected Lord. And so he's like the 12 if you like. And he was foundational also for the early church. The universal church was built upon Jesus as the cornerstone and the foundation that was laid by these men, uh, including Paul. And so the foundation is not just the Old Testament scriptures, which they had at that point, but it was also the foundation was Jesus and these men. They were foundational in their person and in their teaching because they'd been with Christ. And they'd seen the resurrected Lord Jesus. And so, if, if God can save someone like this, really anytime he wants, it actually gives us great hope that even the toughest unbelievers can be saved by the grace of God. In, in John chapter 1, it says, we are born again, not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. Jesus himself said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And so I would encourage you, as I'm encouraging myself today, that we keep praying for friends and family that don't yet know Christ, because God can do anything to save them and to step into their lives. And, and that's why Paul preached the grace of God, because he had experienced the grace of God. He was saved by grace. It was nothing he did. Um, and it's why he also believed in predestination unto salvation. That, that God chose him and, and stepped into his life without an invitation. And although our faith and our choices are involved, 
we actually believe because God is already at work. We were chosen in Christ. Every believer was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. And it says in Romans, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. It's really a family secret that you understand by faith. And so, Paul's choices were not even taken into account here. He only exercised his free will when he was persecuting Christians and what came naturally to him. But it took the grace of God to save him. So I want to encourage you in this. And um, I want to say to you that um, when God steps into your life like this, he doesn't destroy your personality. If you're listening and you're not a Christian, it doesn't destroy your personality, but he regenerates you. He changes you on the inside, gives you a new heart and liberates you. And, and it's really a, a miracle. It's really a miracle. You can't make yourself a Christian. You can't make yourself a Christian. It's a miracle that God does and he steps into your life. You can make yourself a Muslim today. You can make yourself a Hindu. You can make yourself an atheist, but you can't make yourself a Christian. You need God to, to open your eyes to see who Jesus is. And so I, I just feel this is so important for us uh, to get this, this, this biblical view of a big, good God in an age where individual choice is so important from, from you know, pro-choice in terms of abortion or not, or it's my choice to wear a mask or not wear a mask, or even my choice in terms of choosing my, my gender. And I want to suggest to you that sometimes our choices are not always helpful. There was something that happened in, in England two weeks ago where the government announced that they would not proceed with the proposed reforms to the 2004 Gender Recognition Act, which allowed people to change their legal gender and obtain a new birth certificate through self-identification. In other words, you could change your gender from being a male to a female, or female to a male, or whatever. Um, and this writer in this article says, support for self-identification is, is a further step on the journey of society today. And if self-identification is accepted, then anyone can define their own gender without any consideration for their body physically or even their internal uh, sense of, of gender. And so self-ID rejects the body as a source of authority, but it also rejects your internal feelings as a source of authority. And the only authority left is your individual choice. And so it really is an identity issue. You no longer need an external identity to define who you are. You no longer even need an internal identity based on your feelings. You can now have an identity based on your choice. We are who we say we are. And that's a shift from we are who we feel we are. And, and so this is what the world is going through today, the power of individual choice. And, and these are the ideas in which young people especially are swimming today. Um, and so we need to even ask ourselves, how do we help people with this whole development? And so we need to talk about identity as Christians. We receive a new identity in Christ that's received, not just achieved. We need to affirm the goodness of authority. And we need to affirm the goodness of the physical world and, and the body, the bodies that God has given us in a world that's increasingly lived in a non-physical world like the internet. And so this is what we're going through today. And I just want to suggest that it's wonderful that God can help us um, and that everything doesn't just depend on our individual choice. Um, because, in fact, it's, it's, it can be a burden to carry, actually. And so in this passage, we see a good and strong God stepping in and saving Saul and sending Ananias. So let's turn now to to Ananias and say a few things about our reluctant witness. Um, and I want to look at how he reached out to, to Saul. Um, 
I'm going to speak about how we need to reach out to others, uh, using him as an example in areas of mission and evangelism, but just generally reaching out to folk. Um, but before I get into looking at Ananias, notice the Lord told him a few things. He told him specifically who to go to, to go to Saul, exactly where he was in Judas's house. Um, what he was doing, he was praying. Um, uh, he told him about Paul's calling. He said, he's my chosen vessel. He said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go and pray for him. And he said, I want you to know that Paul's also expecting you because he's had a similar vision about a man named Ananias coming and lay, laying his hands on him. And so it's incredible the detail that God gives him. And just as a side, I want to suggest that God also notices our prayers just as he noticed that, that Saul was praying. God notices our prayers. And, um, and, and, and prayer is needed. Here Paul, is, his whole life is flashing in front of him. His, his entire theology, his, his, his whole intent, his actions, his whole life uh, has been revealed to be, to be wrong. He's on the wrong road. And, and he's transitioning and he's met the Lord Jesus and he's praying. And prayer really helps us, beloved, through times of transition whether it's personal transition or whether it's a transition as your family or in, in a work situation or as a church or even as a nation like this COVID time. Uh, prayer is something that, that helps us as we navigate change and, and tunes us into what God is saying to us next. And I really would encourage you to come and join us in prayer as a church to, to, to click on the Zoom link and to come and join us on Wednesdays to pray as we pray at a time like this. It's something God's been saying to us. And I would encourage you as you listen to this to, to come and pray with us. Um, as Paul is doing right here. As he's praying and he's evaluating his life. And God is giving him a, a new future and a new hope. And he's busy preparing himself for that in prayer. So I'd encourage you to do that as well. And it's also good to spend time just evaluating your life as Paul did this every so often. Am I on the right track? Am I doing what God wants me to do? What else is God saying to me? And so Paul, like, like Martin Luther during the Reformation, he was, he was rethinking all the Old Testament scriptures in light of his encounter with Jesus. And then we find this man, Ananias, who's really a nobody, and God loves using the nobodies to reach somebodies for the kingdom of God. And, and that encourages me, and I trust it encourages you. And Ananias plays a key role in the conversion of Saul, even though he tries to talk the Lord out of it. Um, and, and, and he's scared. He's afraid um, because Saul is an angry older brother, and uh, he's been throwing people into jail. And, and uh, you know, now he's told to go and make friends with a fanatic. Um, and, and yet he responds and, and, and he goes. And, and I want us to see just a few points as I draw to a close how the Lord prepared Ananias as well. Notice firstly that God is often at work before you get to people. Before you speak to people, before you share your faith or befriend people, the Lord is already at work. He's already at work in the city. He said, Paul's at Judas' house on Straight Street. And we, we need to ask the Lord, Lord, where do I need to go to in my city and in my workplace and in my connections of friends and family and relatives? Who do you want me to, to speak to? Because the Lord has prepared folk already. We see he also uses the supernatural. Um, there were visions and prophetic words and healing that took place in this encounter. God uses the, the, the things of the Spirit to reach people. And as I've said already, He uses people like Ananias. Ananias, who's really a nobody. We never hear of him again in the Scriptures. He, he becomes the link. God uses small fish to catch big fish. And so God prepares the way before we get there. But God will also work in you before you get to people. We see that Ananias was very reluctant because he was understandably fearful. He didn't want to go. And I probably would have been the same. And, and sometimes God has to work in us to help us to reach out to others. And so we have to ask ourselves, friends, what are the idols in my own heart as a Christian that prevent me from reaching out to others? 
What are the idols in my own heart? Whatever our big strategies are for reaching the city for Christ, if we do not apply the gospel to our own hearts, then we won't reach out. You have to become an object yourself of gospel renewal before you can become an agent of gospel salvation for others. So we have to ask ourselves, what's going on in my life? What, 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 what idols are at work? In my, are there idols of comfort? I'm just too comfortable. I just couldn't be bothered, really. Or idols of fear. I'm afraid to speak. Or approval. What happens if they reject me and I'm not approved? Or selfishness or busyness or racism. I don't want to talk to somebody from another culture. And so for Ananias, it was an idol of fear. And for, for Saul, it, he had an idol of religious culture that prevented them both from fulfilling the will of God in their lives. And I would encourage you to, to spend some time. I've put it in the the, the, the reflection uh, points after this message to ask God, what, what's going on in my life, Lord? Why am I reluctant sometimes to, to reach out to others and even to pray and join in with others in prayer? Lord, deal with my heart first so that I can be an agent of the gospel because you've done a work in my heart. And then to step out thirdly and to connect with others. And so that's what Ananias does. He steps into Saul's story just as Philip stepped into the Ethiopian story and began to talk to them. It says in Colossians chapter 4, verse 5, we need to walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time and the most of every opportunity. And so we need to walk towards outsiders and those that don't know Christ with wisdom. And, and so even to ask ourselves, what are some of the health indicators you are walking towards outsiders? Well, that you have unsafe friends, that you have friends that are not Christians. And if you don't, and I'm speaking to myself, you need to get out there and make some friends and get involved in the world again. Do you know any angry older brothers? Do you know any sinful younger brothers, any needy people, any sad people. We need to be intentional about our relationships and focus on a few for Christ. And so that's what happens with Ananias. And then, and then fourthly, we see that Ananias goes and he finds Saul and he goes in and he lays hands on Saul. He moved through his fears and, and to touch somebody's life. Can you imagine what it meant to Saul as he realized how he damaged the church, how he damaged Christ's cause, and then to have Ananias come and lay his hands on him and say, Brother Saul, the Lord has sent me to you. Those were the first words that Saul heard as a Christian. Brother Saul. Saul. He was welcomed into the family of God. Those really were words of life. And there's so many people out there in our city and in your circle of friends that are just looking for, for similar words of life as we touch lives and connect with others as well. And so we find that he does that. He prays for his healing. He's filled with the Spirit. He's baptized. And Saul gets up immediately and begins to preach that Christ is the Son of God. And the rest we can read through the book of Acts. And so Ananias is, as I draw to a close, is one of our unsung heroes in the early church. He's, he's told to go and help a man who's come here to throw you into prison. He's reluctant. He doesn't want to hand himself over to the spiritual police. But he submits to God. And God uses him powerfully to, to reach this man called Saul who becomes Paul. And so our friends, our mission is to love our friends and other people, even hostile people, into the kingdom of God. And I would encourage you to, to do that. I believe there are many Ananiases in the church today, people who are just sitting there, perhaps not realizing that they can make a huge difference. And so I would encourage you to open yourself up to God, a God who can do anything. He can step into somebody's life like that. It's not just about your, your personal choices. God can override those. It may sound strange in the society in which we live, but he can step in and save someone instantly. And we need to go with that knowledge and go knowing that God can use us and go with words of life 
and go to lay hands on others and touch them and change their lives. We serve a big God. We see that in the story of the saving of the Apostle Paul. A God who saves and a God who sends. We need to see so much more saving and sending these days. We see what God did in the life of the Apostle Paul, and we see how God pushed a reluctant Ananias into the hands of this next great leader of the early church. May you be encouraged by this message as you spend time with the Lord and, and ask Him to, to work in your own heart to, to help you to pray um, during this time. Pray with others and also to prepare you for mission, to prepare you to do the book of Acts again in our generation. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for your word and what we see in your word. Thank you. Your word is alive and active. We pray, Lord, that you would keep working in our hearts uh, and cause the gospel to change us, Lord, and deal with our idols and our reluctance and our fears and our comforts and our selfishness, Lord, in order that you may get us moving again to be on mission with you, even as they were in the book of Acts. We pray this in the name of Jesus and for your glory. Amen.